Of course, in any film on India, you expect to see poverty. But once you delve beneath the surface of that poverty, you quickly discover something worse, and that's oppression. And when you delve beneath the surface of oppression, that is when you discover something that is as pervasive as it is outrageous in the 21st century in the world's largest democracy. It's a cry from a broken people that the world has yet to heed, and that is India's hidden slavery. A certain percentage of the Dalit population are told that by birth their job is to clean human excrement. So they are also called people who carry the noit soil. They carry on their shoulders and in their hands, on their heads, buckets full of human excrement and they clean the toilets of uh, upper caste and other caste people. If this is not slavery, what is slavery? If this is not uh, oppressing and dehumanizing another chunk of humanity and saying, this, your, this is your occasion by birth. I think in my nearly 40 years of journalism, I have seen what man can do to man. I've seen it in the context of race and politics, but what man can do to man in the context of caste, again, transcends everything else that I've ever seen. Certainly the mainstream till now avoided the caste issue and the, the oppression that they brought because they knew that if they disturbed the social status quo, they will be politically, they will suffer. And so they didn't have much courage to do it. Dalits, as the people belonging to the absolute lowest caste, beyond the pale, they can be killed for touching somebody, they can be killed for skinning a dead cow, and you will find the highest of the land trying to explain it away as a minor misunderstanding. Incredible India. That's the catchphrase from the Indian government in its new all-out pitch for Western investment and tourism. And it's true, India is incredible. That is, if you can cope with the heat, the dust, the mosquitoes, the roaring, hooting traffic, the teeming crowds, and of course, the poverty. Yet despite the obvious downsides to its life, it's easy to fall in love with India. Its fascinating faces, its stupendous monuments, its temples and culture, its bright, rich colors, most of all to love its people, all 1.1 billion of them, who together constitute the world's largest democracy, on course along with China to become one of the world's two richest economies. But there is another side to India, which is more hidden from view, which exists at a deeper level than poverty. For centuries, social injustice has been endemic in India, a country where the top 10% of the population use up 70% of its resources, the middle 20%, 20% of the resources, and the bottom 70% of the population have only the remaining 10% left. It's not difficult to recognise the marked difference between those who have and those who have not. So why is it that India continues to tolerate the conditions of its underclass of around 700 million people, around half of whom live beneath the poverty line, set at 327 rupees a month, around four pounds or eight dollars in Western money? The truly incredible side of India is not that 3,000 years ago the minority Aryan invaders plunged the country's majority tribal people into poverty and slavery, but that today very little has changed for India's lower and outcast peoples. Today, in this growingly rich country, the worst levels of poverty are still found everywhere. And even more incredible is the link between poverty and slavery. For there is more slavery in India today than in the entire African continent. And there is more slavery in India today than in any country, in any place, at any time in history. India's hidden slavery, 
must remain hidden no longer. The current understanding and analysis of India is almost exclusively based on purely an economical analysis. But India is not only governed by econ economics, it's also, been, it's also governed by its social system. Unlike any other part of the world, we have a social system that governs all of life, and it's been doing so for nearly 3,000 years. Yes, we have the constitution, we have the laws of the land, we have uh, rules, etc. But when it comes to societal living, the caste system is what dominates the lives of people from birth to marriage to occupation to death and beyond. And so if you don't look and analyze India according to the caste analysis, you never get a true picture of India. Well, caste system is a system that has been created by the Hindu scriptures themselves. It is a creation of uh, a Brahmin's idea through writing of first book called Rig Veda. Now what it did was very interesting. In the Rig Veda, the 10th uh, chapter of the book said that God created the Brahmins from his head, the ruling class called Kshatriyas from his shoulders, and the business caste called Vaishyas, which Gandhi belonged to, uh, was said to have been created from God's thighs. And the Sudras, uh, the OBCs to which I belong to, were said to have been created from God's feet. And the untouchables, the Dalits, what we call today, are said to have, been, to have not been created by God at all. So that's so, the caste is a creation of religion, uh, Hindu religion in a sense. This caste-based analysis of India's social system reveals far more than just the economic gap between rich and poor. For India's Dalit population, like this family who for 20 years had been enslaved in what's now called bonded labour, caste has meant simply centuries of misery and deprivation. This enslavement, amazingly, is still justified by a religiously sanctioned view of life which renders Dalits, once called untouchables, as somehow subhuman, outcast, and to be treated as the despised dregs of Indian society. My name is Ravi. I don't know how old I am. My mother thinks I'm 12. Since I was small, I've been forced to work in bonded labour. I work for the landlord in his guest house, where I move heavy crates and do other kinds of heavy work. I also do the cleaning, including the most disgusting jobs. The food they give me is very poor, and it's made me ill quite a few times. They pay me only a few rupees a day. I'm not satisfied with this, but what can I do? I can't run away, as there's no other way to survive. Ravi's mother came to this village with her husband to be near to her sister. But they came owing money. They are a family of eight, with two sons and four daughters. They thought that by having a large family, they would have boys to work for them and keep the family fed. As it worked out, they had to borrow money to pay for husbands for their daughters. That's when the loan sharks moved in. The landlord here promised to pay the debts off for them, but at a very high interest rate. It means now the whole family has to work for him for practically nothing. And since the interest is so high, they'll never be able to pay off their loan. It's 14 hours a day, each day, every day, with no days off. If, as at the moment, Ravi's mother cannot work, then her sister has to come and work in her place. And now her two boys are ill with flu, she doesn't know what to do, and thinks the landlord will want her to pay him back with food, when, as it is, they hardly have enough to live on. In the village of Udameri, this boy Arjun is one of India's 44 million working children, many of whom are exploited by unscrupulous employers in bonded labour. Arjun is a Dalit, an untouchable, and since the age of eight there's been no one to look after him. His mother died six years ago, and within weeks, his father took up with another woman, but contracted HIV, and not long afterwards, died of AIDS. Five years ago, desperate for food and shelter, Arjun was picked out by a local landowner, who in return for a contract of servitude, provides him with pitiful living conditions and a daily meal of watery soup and rice. When he came out, from that time onwards, he is doing labor here and there, and getting little, little money and feeding himself, clothing himself. 
and um, yeah, like that he is suffering. Like uh, he is uh, an orphan, he is. The, he is working in labor, mason labor, that agriculture labor, whatever work he'll get, that he'll do, and get little little money, feed himself. That's all his work and uh, his way of living standard. Recently, after some careful negotiation, a local Good Shepherd school set up by Indian charities to help Dalit children has negotiated a few lessons for Arjun with the other children. Apart from them and his teacher David. There's no one to look out for Arjun except himself. Arjun's upper caste landlord continues to beat him and exploit his labour. India has the largest number of working children in the world. Whether they are sweating in the heat of stone quarries, working in the fields 16 hours a day, picking up rags in city streets, or hidden away as domestic servants, these children endure miserable and difficult lives. You often say that without a caste analysis, India cannot be understood. Why is this? The caste system gives uh, benefits and privileges, uh, economic, social, political, religious, to about 15% of the population. That's 150 million out of a billion. They have exclusive privileges. At the bottom level are 250 million so-called scheduled castes and scheduled tribes forming the Dalit population, 250 million, who are outside the caste system and have no privileges at all. Add to that what are known traditionally as the slave caste or the Sudra caste. They are about 45% uh, percent of the population. Suddenly you see there's huge masses of people who actually do not profit from the caste system. And for, again, a very long time, the caste system has ensured that a small minority governs, rules, and organizes life in India at every level, social, political, economic, religious. Commentators sometimes speak of India's hidden slavery or India's hidden apartheid. So what would your own view be of such a pessimistic and negative analysis? It's an honest analysis, according to me. And when the Durban Conference on Racism, UN Conference on Racism took place, Dalit leaders from across India, who for the first time, because of globalization, were able to participate, went there with boards and slogans saying, caste is worse than racism. They were hitting the nail on the head. Because there's nothing comparable to the caste system anywhere in the world. I mean, the West has had its problem with racism. America has had its problem with racism. But nowhere in America was it that if a white touched a black person, he had to go and bathe himself to become pure. Or if a black person went into a church, the church got polluted. Here you have a system that basically says that a vast chunk of people, the outcast, 250 million people, are less than humans. And they are impure polluting people, any contact with them socially, religiously, etc., uh, def uh, defiles them. So when people talk about India's hidden slavery, India's hidden apartheid, uh, it is a correct statement because we have an appearance on the surface that everything is hunky-dory, going well and fine. But you have to leave the cities and just go 30, 40 kilometers away, and the other reality meets you. And the reality is of a caste-run India. How many suffer adversely from the caste system in relation to how many benefit from it? I, I can give loads of examples. But let me give you one recent one, which has been in the Indian uh, newspapers, and it's been on national news, etc. You know, untouchability was banned by cost constitution. Um, and the constitution was given to us by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the father of the Dalit movement, the main Dalit leader, and really the, one of the main builders of modern India who gave us the constitution. Untouchability was banned, and the occupations that came out of untouchability were banned, especially the occupation of what is known as scavenging. Now, scavenging is a certain percentage of the Dalit population are told that by birth their job is 
to clean human excrement. So they are also called people who carry the noit soil. They carry on their shoulders and in their hands, on their heads, buckets full of human excrement and they clean the toilets of uh, upper caste and other caste people. That's supposed to have been, uh, supposed to have been uh, taken care of, should have disappeared after 50 years. Suddenly, you hear a statistic that there are two million of them right now across the country who still carry night soil. If this is not slavery, what is slavery? If this is not uh, oppressing and dehumanizing another chunk of humanity and saying, this, your, this is your occasion by birth. Manual scavenging is dirty, humiliating work, and full of health risks. It was banned in 1993, and though estimates vary, India still has between 750,000 and possibly even 2 million so-called night soil workers, still working for just a few rupees a month. So when this boy Ranjit, 11 years old, arrives at the Brahmin's house at the other end of his village, he is the silent visitor the household members will never see. Every day, through the back door, Ranjit makes his quiet and unobtrusive entry, while the other children bathe, eat their breakfast, and leave for school. And as they do, from the dry latrine, Ranjit will scrape and scrub and clean up their excreta. This is the occupation to which Ranjit is born, and unless the Indian government stop this practice for good, this will be Ranjit's job for life. Isn't it somewhat outrageous that in today's world people are still engaged in such degrading, even disgusting work as manual scavenging and street sweeping? Yes, it is. And uh, uh, we are trying to improve the situations. And, uh, uh, but it will take some time. It will take some time. But the consciousness is there. Everybody recognizes it. The fact is that uh, it is recognized and perhaps always we can say more effort should have been put and should be put even now. But uh, uh, that it still exists in this era and after so many years of independence is something which should worry us and it does worry us. How true is the claim and to what extent do you consider that there is hidden slavery in India? Well, I can say that hidden in the sense the upper strata of society does not recognize it or feel it. But those who suffer, it's not hidden to them. It's a hard reality. And this has come out of the caste system which is a hierarchical system. Highest, next, next, lowest. And this caste system, which is based on birth, defined the economic, social and political coordinates of every person. That was the uh, situation. Since Dalits are regarded as the dregs of the Indian social system, exploitation is literally the story of their lives. This extends often in deep and shocking ways to their daily labour and the poor, sometimes horrific conditions under which they live. We travelled to a small settlement just 15 minutes drive north of Secundrabad. In the local language, it's known as Pipe Village. And for 53 families, this is a place they call home.
These pipes are originally designed for sewage and they are made in the factory just a few steps away here in Andhra Pradesh. Amazingly, these pipes are homes. In the factory, the people make the pipes and here in the village, they live in them. The cracked ones, that is. These are the reject pipes and that's quite a problem as when it rains, as it does at times rather heavily in India, the occupants get soaked. And correspondingly, when the sun shines and it's ultra hot, there's no ventilation and the pipe turns into a pizza oven and the inhabitants get really unpleasantly hot. The accommodation in Pipe Village is unusual, poor and frankly squalid, without even dry latrines, running water or cooking facilities. There may be a roof over their heads, but villagers understandably regard this as a pretty tough life, all the more so because unwittingly they have become subjects of exploitation. Now the reason for this is not just that the villagers are Dalits. The fact is most are not local people. In the last couple of years, many have come from further north in India in search of work. And that's how they have fallen easy prey to those who control the purse strings at the factory. What's happened is in return for minimal food and a dreadful standard of shelter, around 50% of these people are now in bonded labour. The haves exploit the have-nots. For some, the hope of a better life has withered on the vine. These people have had to sell their lives, their labours and all their energies just to exist. And effectively, they are enslaved to callous, ruthless, exploitative, higher caste Indian landlords the bosses who show little evidence of any kind of practical kindness or compassion. And as bosses, they have high expectations. For all labourers here, nothing less than sweated labour, up to 14 hours a day, 365 days a year, and woe betide anybody who drops out or who can't stand the pace. All this to keep their masters amply fed and supplied with every creature comfort. While by contrast, the villagers live lives as broken as the pipes they inhabit as their homes. Bonded labour is also known as debt bondage and it occurs when uh, a family or an individual borrows money from a moneylender who then imposes extremely high interest rates uh, so that they cannot pay back the original loan. And then the, the person and very often the whole family, and this can even happen down the generations, is held in uh, bondage to the person who lent the money in the first place, who is often very exploitative uh, of their labour as a result. Such bonded labour is found in particularly potent form in Pipe Village with what can only be described as a callous indifference to their sufferings. Such contractors who own and run these places have deliberately exploited both their caste and their poverty. The caste system gives them centuries of precedent for their exploitation. They've sought and found the cheapest labour possible and they pay them nothing more than slave wages. Leeching off the desperation of these vulnerable families, they've enticed them to such places as these, this isolated wasteland. And here they live, without facilities of any kind, in shameful conditions, from where enslaved as they are, they have little hope of escape. I came here with my family from a village far away. We came because it was very difficult for any of us to live without work. Our job was to make scent to be sold in the markets, though we couldn't sell it ourselves because we are Dalits. One day we lost our jobs. As a result, we had no food and feared we would die of starvation. Then a man came to the village and offered to lend us money. The deal was we would go with him to the city. He would pay off our debts and provide housing, and we would work for him. We had no idea how awful it would be here, and he set such a high rate of interest, we'll never be able to pay him back. Our boss pays such a small wage, there's hardly enough for food, and often we're very hungry. The children play with sticks and stones. We're far from shops and other people. It's certainly like being a slave, because we are prisoners. We can't get out of here. The only hope is to settle with our contractor, and that, he's ensured, we'll never be able to do. Isn't it remarkable that these people are regarded as subhuman, 
worthless and a justified object of violence and exploitation. Yet the Dalits, though a broken people, do make every effort to cling to their human dignity. As far as they can afford to, and when they are not attacked for doing so, the women dress themselves in bright and attractive colours, and with cheap but pretty bangles, necklaces and earrings. These children, whose labour is to collect twigs all day, clearly take care of their appearance. They wanted to adjust their appearance for the camera, even though they've never seen TV fashion ads or a Miss World contest. Our family is very poor. It's because we were near to starvation that we came to this place. But we were misled. In fact, we were tricked about how much we would earn. We get less pay here than in our previous village and were expected to work far longer, sometimes in excess of a 14-hour day, seven days a week. It started like this. One of the contractors told us that he would give us money to settle our debts. He paid us 20,000 rupees, and in return he said he would expect my husband and me to work for him for 10 months for no further pay, and then pay him interest on his loan. Well, we realised too late it's impossible to do that. Now it's nearly impossible to eat, apart from help from friends. And it really seems impossible that we'll ever break free from him or this place. So, we've been here four years now, and our children are suffering, for they have little to occupy their time. There is no school, and we have no transport to find education for them. Anyway, we're Dalits and people hate us. Our future looks as bleak as our present and our past. To anyone from outside India, seeing the treatment of uh, Dalits and downtrodden peoples in India is a shock to the system. Uh, one reads about it before, one may see films on it before and so on, but to see it before your very eyes, and also the dismissive way in which some members of Indian society talk about or interact with their fellow human beings is on occasion deeply disturbing to a middle-class Englishman like me. It's their karma. They have brought it on themselves. You keep away from them. They are just Dalit. Wherever you travel in India, these dismissive and negative attitudes towards Dalits are found everywhere. And the prejudice is amply matched by a cruel form of social enslavement, as for centuries, Dalits have been locked into the most degrading occupations and have been subject to the worst kind of caste-based discrimination. This is especially the case in rural India, and its 600,000 villages. In a recent survey, which was the first of its kind, it was discovered that the full-scale practice of untouchability is rife in as many as 80% of these communities. What that means in practice is denial of access to places like temples, restaurants, wells for drinking water, barber services, to the dobi, the laundress, and then discrimination in educational institutions, public health centres, and in the use of utensils, like cups and mugs, in places where the presence of Dalits is otherwise tolerated. Restrictions include market trading, or involvement in any kind of business, and even a bar on sharing public burial facilities. Permitted occupations are the lowest of the low, including skinning and removing dead carcasses, street sweeping in the smelliest and grossest conditions, and as we've seen already, manual scavenging. As far back as 1955, and again in 1976, many of these restrictions were banned by the Indian government. Yet the Anti-Untouchability Act and the Protection of Civil Rights Act are largely ignored and unenforced by state governments. We spoke to P. Anjaya of ActionAid International on the publication day of the report Untouchability in Rural India, and he spoke of further depths to which Dalits, and especially Dalit women, are subjected. Basically, uh, when we talk about uh, caste-based discrimination or practice of untouchability, unclean occupation is one of the important factors because which is imposed on the Dalit families alone. For instance, if you take what I mean to say unclean occupation, there is a concept of uh, you know the called purity and pollution. So if you take, for example, you must be knowing about the uh, Devadasi system. That is also kind of a ritual prostitution 
it's a kind of it's called ritual prostitution which is imposed upon only dalit community uh, girls and girls when they reach the puberty they are imposed upon that no other uh, girls are engaged in this kind of ritual prostitution published by action aid in 2006 untouchability in rural india has provided devastating evidence of continuing oppression towards india's dalits such oppression flows directly from official hindu teaching from the rigveda a manusmriti which regards a quarter of India's population as somehow subhuman and a dangerous source of pollution. And it is women that come in for particularly shameful treatment. Working in the fields and homes of non-Dalits exposes Dalit women to widespread and widely reported sexual abuse and violence. These are crimes which rarely reach the courts, and when they do, rarely secure convictions. But perhaps the greatest outrage against women and inextricably linked with the Hindu temple is the practice of ritual prostitution. Devadasi is a Sanskrit word meaning a servant of God. Young Dalit girls at the age of 10 or less are recruited to be married to the temple or its deity. So begins their life as a Devadasi. They have ordinary duties to do like cleaning, lighting lamps and dressing the deities in the temple. They will sing devotional songs and will dance for services and funerals and teach dance to younger girls. But above all, what is required from them is their availability to give sexual favors to the Hindu priest, become mistress to a patron and those to whom the patron and the priest together offer her. The Devadasi is a victim as a child, she has no choice about her so-called marriage to the temple or its gods, and no way of freeing herself except by increasing age when she is unable to perform sexually. In retirement, she will have no husband or family to look after her. She will be literally penniless and unloved. These women are all Devadasis. Some are still active and some older and retired. They all bear the pains of outrageous exploitation and its attendant suffering. This is Anasuya. She has spent most of her life as a Devadasi. In Andhra Pradesh, where she lives, she's known by the local term Jogini, which is another name for ritual prostitution, along with Nambasivi, Matama, and Venkatasani, and other names for Devadasi in other places in India. In fact, like many Devadasi, Anasuya's mother was a Jogani before her. And of course, Anasuya has never known her father. I was made a Jogani at the age of six and dedicated to our temple's god Yelhama. Very soon after, I was treated as the property of the whole village, at least of the upper caste men, and they used to expect me to fulfill their wishes whenever they wanted. Before I reached puberty, they used to drug me before having sex with them, and some of them were very brutal. I could never say no, of course. It was more than my life was worth. All of us Jogneys were treated worse even than the regular sex workers. They used to jeer at us in the streets and sometimes throw stones at us. Only when we danced at weddings and funerals were we treated with dignity. But that's past now because I am one of the lucky ones. Against all the odds, with the help of some NGO workers, I broke free of Jogni work a couple of years back. It's not easy, as I am still known for this role that I never wanted for myself. But though people despise me, and although I have nightmares and feel bad about myself, it is better than being a slave, for that is what I was, and there are still so many like me.
This is Narasama, who has a son for whom she has managed to provide education. However, Narasama's story is a painful one. I have five brothers, but I was the only daughter. My father didn't want to provide a dowry for a husband for me. He was too poor. So when I was eight years old, I was married to the temple instead. My cousin took me and sold me as a Devadasi, but never explained to me what was happening. I was just left there, and I was so unhappy. When I reached my teens and the Brahmin priest and his friends started to take an interest in me, then I realised what a jogini is, and I cried and cried, but could do nothing about it. Of course, my son does not know who his father is, and nor do I, but now I'm older, he wants me to give up this jogini practice. He's ashamed because people call him that jogini's son, but I can't give up, not yet, because he would have no money and nowhere to live. Apart from my son, I don't have a person in the world with whom to share our happiness or sorrows. I am treated like a prostitute, even though I have been forced into what I do. When he was small, my son was always asking details about his father. How could I tell him? How could I tell him I've been a sex slave since I was eight years old? Despite genuine government attempts to stamp out the exploitative Devadasi system, there are still an astonishing 250,000 Devadasi girls scattered across India, with high concentrations in the Alama temples of the so-called Devadasi belt of Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka and Maharashtra. The practice was indeed outlawed in 1988, but like so much national human rights legislation in India, at the state level, these laws are sometimes hardly applied at all. For so many of the Dalits that I met in India, their most pressing need is actually a question of subsistence and existing from day to day, finding something to eat, providing for their immediate family. But actually in terms of tackling the bigger problem, I think the most pressing need is for a, a much wider, much more frank discussion about caste-based issues within India itself. Gandhi did not understand or was not willing to understand how the caste system as a whole was the cause of the symptom of untouchability. So what happened in the constitution was untouchability got banned, but the root problem, the creator of the problem, the caste system itself, was less left as it is. Unless caste ends in India, not just casteism, not just untouchability, but the very concept of caste which says man is not born equal. Unless it ends, India can just never take its place in the list of developed progressive nations. From the evidence that I saw in my most recent visit to India, I would say that particularly out in, 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 in the rural parts, uh, caste-based discrimination is a major, highly significant factor in terms of the poverty that many Dalits live in. The gap between rich and poor remains very wide and it is not getting any smaller and it is the Dalits at the bottom of Indian society who are losing out. They lag behind substantially in terms of education and literacy. The literacy gap, as it were, between Dalits and non-Dalits remains substantial. And without equality in education, Dalits will not be able to contribute to e India's economic boom in the way that they might, and they certainly will not reap the benefits from it. Could you tell economic partners of India, they must make equal opportunity, they must make this war against caste part of the deal with India. Business also has a role to play, as increasingly there is foreign investments being made in India. I think these companies actually have a duty to talk to officials on the ground about the impact that their investments will have on Dalits. Will the investment really bring benefits to the Dalit community in a particular area where a foreign interest is investing? Let me find out how many Dalits Coca-Cola employs, how many Dalits GM employs, how many Dalits uh, Walmart will employ when it comes to India, what is Intel's position, what is Nokia doing about it. Let's find that one out. I think we'll have an answer there. Let them show the way. Let DuPont tell its partner, Reliance, Brothers, employ Dalits. Go out and open schools for them. Tell the government of India that our economic progress depends on the evolution of caste. Tell them that and they will listen.
India today is one of the world's fastest growing economies. It is a modernizing democracy. Huge strides are being made in technology, medicine, education, and in practically every field of human achievement. High-tech cities, such as in Hyderabad, are emerging swiftly, as in urban areas especially, new air-conditioned commercial buildings with state-of-the-art equipment spring up almost weekly. It is a tremendous and awesome achievement. India has so much to be proud of. So how can it be proper, realistic or even fair to such an impressively emergent and leading member of all the world's democracies to speak of India's hidden slavery? Doesn't slavery talk make you think of shackles and chains, fastened wrists and manacled ankles, slave ships and children working down the mines? The fact is, as we have seen, modern-day slavery does exist, and in India too. It is different in form, but not in substance. For here it is lives which are in chains, chains of a caste-bred social order which hold firm and fast and resist any attempts to break them. Modern-day slavery always involves removing the right to choose from the enslaved individual. They may be forced to work through mental or physical threats, as in bonded labour. They will be owned or controlled by an employer, usually through actual or threatened mental or physical abuse. They will be dehumanised, treated as less than human, regarded as a commodity or bought and sold as property. They will have restrictions placed on their activities and movements. This is modern-day slavery. This is why it is no exaggeration to speak of India's 167 million scheduled castes and 84 million scheduled tribes as enslaved people. The majority of this massive portion of India's population, equivalent to the combined populations of Germany, France, Spain and the UK all put together, is still subject to the worst excesses of caste discrimination, segregation, violence and oppression. There are huge numbers of people in bonded labour, even more simply denied the benefit of basic human rights and freedoms. All this has gone on for 3,000 years, since the Aryans first invaded India. It is extraordinary that so little has changed. Kancha Ailaya was born in 1952 into a sheep rearing community in Papayapet, a small village in the Warangal district of Andhra Pradesh. For generations, his forebears had been illiterate, and Kancha was only enrolled in the local school because they were short of pupils and had to make up the numbers. But the young man shone, and today this modest figure is internationally recognised as one of India's top intellectuals and a leading advocate for the rights of India's Dalit population. Today in India, there is a worrying increase in civil violence, especially from a group known as the Naxalites. In a similar way, the rioting across Maharashtra in late 2006, following an horrific attack on a whole Dalit family, speaks of a deep and powerful expression of anger, which, if nothing is done, could break out with devastating consequences. We asked Professor Ailaya about his views on the future, especially on the urgency of addressing these caste injustices of oppression and exploitation today. So what will happen if caste oppression is not addressed? Well, there will be a civil war on that count, as more and more of us are getting in light, uh, getting uh, modern education, and more and more of us ask for equal rights. And Hinduism will deny that there will be a civil war across the nation. And that civil war will be much more bloodier than what the American civil war was in 1856-57. Luckily at that time there was Abraham Lincoln supporting the blacks. Now in India we may not have that kind of a person, but we can't suppress our historical ambitions to be equal. Our right to embrace any religion should be articulated. If the RSS, Vishwa Hindu Parishad, and the temple system keeps on attacking us, then that will lead to 
a huge civil war kind of situation. We are not going to keep quiet now. The, we are living in a modern world. We should also live in democratic religious world. The world is still you know, coexisting with religion, politics, and capitalism and socialism. So I see that our rights should be respected, and the world has a responsibility, including the United Nations, to see this problem as a huge global problem. The world parliaments, whether it is American Congress, the British Parliament, the European Parliament, see our situation and our aspiration to become equal in every sphere, including the spiritual sphere. Why do they think that our spiritual rights are not important? The world talks about political rights, economic rights, but not spiritual rights. Why? So that's a crucial question in a year where you are going to uh, celebrate uh, Wilberforce, you know, uh, 200th year of uh, passing the abolition of slave laws. Whether the abolition of slave laws applied to us in terms of our spiritual liberation, our social liberation, our political liberation and economic liberation, they should apply to us. The issues of caste-based discrimination are being more and more talked about within Indian society. Uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh recently described untouchability, one of those symptoms, as not just a social discrimination, but no less than a blot on humanity. And he's also drawn a parallel with uh, the system of apartheid in South Africa. I think slavery ultimately was abolished because there was a civilizational repugnance, the whole concept of man enslaving man. It was also then accentuated by political action. I mean, let's not forget that Abraham Lincoln did not shy away from a civil war. He went into a civil war. He enforced his liberal views. And that's what the West did. Here, there is no civilizational abhorrence for the concept of caste. There is possibly a certain amount of, uh, uh, shall we say, embarrassment at untouchability at the pollution line, but not at the concept of caste itself, of which the pollution line is only a minor effect. Well, I'm convinced that India faces a major problem with caste-based discrimination, and I say this as a friend of India, that there's a real uh, problem that needs to get tackled here to do with the pervasive systemic discrimination at work against Dalits and people from lower castes. And in the long term, this issue will ha harm India, it will harm the Indian economy, because we know that the, the kind of societies and economies that will do best in the 21st century are, are open societies where maximum levels of social mobility and any society with ingrained caste-based discrimination isn't best equipped to face the challenges of the 21st century. India has publicly espoused a wish to become a permanent member of the UN Security Council. I have said to people in India and I have recently said to the High Commissioner of India in London that I would find it difficult as a British MP within a country which itself has a permanent seat on the UN Security Council, I would find it difficult to support the accession of India to the UN Security Council as a permanent member, in spite of its uh, huge population and huge uh, influence in the world, as long as this system of caste discrimination goes on in the way in which it does, I think it would be very difficult to accept India as a permanent member of the UN Security Council. India is the world's second largest country, with a present GDP of $720 billion. It produces over 2 million university graduates each year, comparable to, in fact, just exceeding the United States. But with India's total graduate population of 50 million, this still represents less than 5% of the population. Although the provision of tertiary education, as it is now in India, is a notable achievement, in terms of education for the total population, there is clearly so much more to be done. So the emergence of new education initiatives for Dalits provides some real hope for the future. Though Dalit children have not been educated for centuries, the Dalit community themselves recognize that education in English will represent a major contribution to their emancipation. In an historic meeting in Hyderabad in September 2001, the nation's senior Dalit leaders asked to meet with Christian leaders from across the denominations. They pleaded with them 
that they should join them in their struggle for freedom. And they had just one request. Will you please educate our children? Since that time, Dalit education centres have been springing up all over India. Such an opportunity represents a hugely strategic step and will contribute significantly to the eventual end of caste discrimination. But alongside education, other steps are also required. The international community needs to rise up and encourage India that in its journey towards wealth and modernization, that they attend with equal priority to their people's human rights and to the dignity and opportunity of Dalits throughout the nation. B. R. Ambedkar was the main architect of India's constitution. He was one of the first Dalits to gain advanced education and attained a string of doctorates and a leading role in Indian politics. He was a towering figure of justice and wisdom and remains to this day an inspiration to many since his death 50 years ago. On the 29th of November 1930, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar wrote in the New York Times, Untouchability is far worse than slavery, for the latter may be abolished by statute. It will take more than a law to remove this stigma from the people of India. Nothing less than the aroused opinion of the world can do it. Samba Parada is not enough, right? Samba Parada is not enough. Yes. Is it not enough? Samba Parada is not enough. Is it enough? Is it enough? Is it enough? Is it enough? 